Every day, marketers, creatives, journalists, editors, anyone who needs to tell a visual story, sell a product, or illustrate an idea, turn to our sites to find images or videos to help them do so. But with millions of visual assets to choose from, how do they find the perfect one? On today's Tech Connect, we'll show you how our Getty Images Technology Insiders solve the issues and develop the tools that deliver our powerful visual search functionality, including how we explore visually, find similar images for semantics and style, reduce biases in our modeling, and scale up to hundreds of millions of images and videos. So set your phone to airplane mode, settle in for a behind the scenes look at the technology powering world moving imagery. It's time for Tech Connect. Hello and welcome to Tech Connect, our all new webinar series featuring Getty Images team of technology experts. In each episode, you'll see how we develop top of class solutions for issues facing many of today's e-commerce companies, such as industry leading search, AI ML in the creative space, real time content ingestion for the Olympics, in-house video transcoding, and Getty's tech cloud transformation, all through the lens of our global media business. My name is Grant Farhol. I'm your host today and Chief Product Officer for Getty Images. Thank you for joining us for today's episode about visual search. For those of you unfamiliar with our company, our three brands, Getty Images, iStock, and Unsplash, are leaders in visual content. From the latest global news, sports, and entertainment coverage to beautifully crafted creative collections that are perfect for any brand or budget. With over 460 million assets and millions more added each quarter, we're the go-to source for images, videos, and illustrations for over a million customers around the world, providing the tools, research, and workflows they need to tell impactful stories in an increasingly visual world. If you like what you see in here today and wanna to be a part of the exciting projects our teams work on, good news, Getty Images is hiring. You can check out our latest open tech roles at careers.gettyimages.com. Now I'll turn it over to Andrea and our Getty Images technology team to talk about today's topic, how our visual search helps customers find that perfect image. Over to you, Andrea. Thanks, Grant. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrea Gagliano and I lead our artificial intelligence and machine learning team here at Getty Images. I'm joined today by Dan Gifford, Principal Data Scientist, Wendy Koo, Data Scientist, and Greg Sinclair, Search Engineering Lead. And we're excited to share with you today about our visual search. Searching is the primary way our customers find images and videos. They come to our site, make a search for a topic, and look for that perfect visual to tell their story and evoke an emotion. The images our customers download end up all over the world, whether in a news article, on a billboard, or on an Instagram ad. With our visuals everywhere, they have the power to move the world, but searching and finding the perfect visual is hard for our customers, which is where our search team comes in. We are building the next generation visual search experience that is easy, intuitive, and inspirational for our customers. What do I mean by that? let's start with the customer journey. A customer is looking to write an article about business and needs a really compelling image. They come to our site and search for business. They start searching and scrolling through images and they're looking for something warm, something that feels inviting and approachable, not too corporate or cold. They find this one that they really like because there's two people in action and they're in the moment, but they don't love the boxes. So they keep looking for other similars. And they realize they actually really like it when people are at the laptop instead of the boxes. But they'd prefer if the people were both women since the article is about women owned businesses. So they find one they like and ultimately decide to download it. What you're seeing is our current visual search experience and how it can make the process easy, 
fun, and inspiring. Dan is now going to walk you through the model behind the scenes. Wendy will share how the model was evaluated to meet the customer need. And Greg will wrap us up with how the model was brought to production. Off to you, Dan. Thanks, Andrea. Technically, visual search is very different from other forms of search. In traditional search, when a customer enters a text query, we need to break that phrase down into its component keywords in order to match it with the keywords present in our visual library. Sometimes this process can fail because of images that have incorrect keywords added, like this example you see here. In other cases, images that you might want to see fail to show up due to missing keywords that would have been matched with words in the customer query, and keywords can also struggle to capture the more creative or visual aspects of an image, like the depth of field or certain kinds of lighting, or even the color palette. In addition to these challenges, what do you do when an image is your query instead of text entered into a search box? Comparing keywords between images is difficult. When images can have several dozen keywords to consider and the same challenges I just described with missing or incorrect keywords exist in this kind of search as well. Today, we have richer metadata representations called embeddings that are created using the pixels of the images themselves and do not require human application or editing. This kind of metadata allows us to search even if the query image does not have any keywords applied to it as embeddings can be calculated in real time. Embeddings are created by leveraging neural network models that are trained to recognize patterns and objects in visuals like our images. These embeddings are mathematical metadata representations that can be directly compared with one another. When the model is trained, images that visually look similar and contain similar content will have very similar embedding representations. This 3D model of an embedding space illustrates the clusters of similar embeddings present in part of our image library. You can see how those clusters have common visual traits like content, color, and other photographic attributes. We use this model to power multiple products at Getty and on our iStock websites, one of which is our similar images experience that shows you visually similar images to an image you have already clicked on. Since moving from a keyword-based model to a visual-based model to power this product, we've seen giant increases in engagement with our recommended images. We considered several different models in this work, including an open source model, a fine-tuned custom model, and a proprietary in-house model that we trained ourselves. We'll now pass the mic to Wendy, who will discuss how we evaluated and eventually decided on which to use for this system. Thanks, Dan. The next step is to evaluate the basket of models and select one. The best model is one that best suits users' needs, specifically a model that best supports the similar images feature to help users find images based on an image that they already liked. Our user research indicates three main objectives users demand. Semantic similarity, that the returned images contain similar subjects. Stylistic similarity, that the images share a similar facial style. Lastly, diversity and inclusion, to provide a diversity of images in terms of variations in how the image look, as well as model demographics. One approach is to defer to published benchmarks to evaluate and select a model. Here's an example from a state-of-the-art paper published in 2021. However, it is difficult to infer which model best suits your use case based on these metrics. For instance, images in Getty's library are rather different from that in ImageNet. They're more artistic, more complex, often featuring scenes rather than a single object. Next, metrics like top one and top five error rate focus on where the models can correctly predict one label of an image. However, the search problem is often more complex than that. Then, uh, is this a dog or a cat in an image type of question? There are many reasons that draw users to click on an image. Maybe they like the motion blur that shows the dog is running or the grassy background. These accuracy metrics fail to capture more implicit signals and other image labels that our users also do care about. On top of that, this feature outputs a large set of results for each target image, while accuracy metrics mainly address one-to-one -one image label pairs. 
The misfit between common model metrics in our use case motivates us to set up an internal model evaluation framework. Step one is to build a validation set using images from our own library, covering various topics, style, with diverse models. Next, we build an in-house tool as a similar images prototype using a random sample of 10 million images to conduct k-nearest neighbor retrieval. At this stage, we evaluated first page of output results, which means top 16 nearest neighbors for each image. We compare outputs of various models and provide qualitative feedback. On the right, you can see a screenshot of our internal model uh, with the target image on the top and nearest neighbor results of three selected models we're evaluating. Since the qualitative evaluation process is by default more subjective, we took a more structured approach and involved multiple teams in building the evaluation set. In the next part, I will walk us through how we do that for our three main model objectives. The first objective is semantic coverage. Our goal is to cover a variety of topics users search for in Getty. We started off using our internal search category database to ensure we include images from each category, ranging from business to holidays. We also included images with overlaying semantics that span across various categories, such as Black Friday shopping during coronavirus. Then with finished category, we include images from broad to narrow semantics, images that have a broader theme and images with more specific topics. Using landscape images as an example, an example of broad semantics is an image of green mountain ranges with no distinguishable features. As we get into more narrow semantics, the subject matter gets more specific, such as mountainscape in winter with a lake, or a specific geolocation like Yosemite or Mount Fuji in winter. This framework also doubles up as an evaluation framework. For instance, if we search for nearest neighbor images for a New York subway photo, we can see if the model returns generic images of underground tunnels, subway images, or if the model can correctly recall specific images from New York City subway. This then allows us to ask better questions and differentiate an outstanding visual similarity model from other good ones. Here's an example. The Korea image is shot from inside a car from the driver's seat featuring a young black couple standing outside. Seems to be taken in summer. Model one returns images that are either irrelevant or only match a broad subject, the car. Model two returns images with more specific subjects match, mostly people and car images. But model three clearly outperforms, featuring shots that are taken from inside a car, featuring couples outside of a car. This is a method that we use to score different models for each validation image. The second model objective is stylistic similarity. We consulted our global creative research team to articulate different photographic styles and sort them into categories. Some categories include brightness and contrast, composition, color palette, special effects, and studio setup. Establishing these categories allows us to tally images in the validation set and it's very helpful in allowing multiple teams to contribute to the set asynchronously. This is an example with less satisfactory results. The target image features a black woman against a tree. The image is very bright with low contrast and a lens flare right in the middle of the shot. We can see that model B and model C return somewhat stylistically similar results, featuring a silhouette against a background, but the semantic relevance is thrown off there are a lot of images returned that do not include human models, such as these tree and flower images. Our hypothesis is that the models struggle to identify the objects in low or high contrast conditions as there are less texture, hence less useful pixel information for image recognition. This particular example actually has much better results in production when we include all our images in the index. However, this scenario also does expose limitations of these visual similarity models, as stylistic similarity sometimes takes precedence over semantic relevance in a way that we don't have direct control over. This is still a problem that our team is actively trying to solve. The third model objective is diversity and inclusion. Our goal is to include images from various demographics dimensions, 
particularly gender, ethnicity, and age. We added data points to establish coverage in the matrix. While there's no way to achieve perfect representation, we're striving for a more balanced validation set to reduce the chance that there are harmful results output by the model. Since we're well aware that many biases are built into open source models, we want to proactively hunt for these gender biases by applying challenging data points. We added images featuring models of facial features that stereotypically belong to the opposite gender, such as images of male models with long hair, wearing makeup and dresses, as well as women with unshaved armpits. We also added images with models of various body sizes, with disability, and with various levels of occlusion, such as glasses and facial hair. We found that most models are agnostic to human demographics. In this example, our query image is a pseudo shot of a young white female in red blouse against a black background. You can see that model A returns some images with children, model B returns some images with men, and model C returns women of various ethnicities. While we're not certain what users are looking for with regards to demographics and recommended images, we've erred on a side of caution, making sure that the model is not overly sensitive with any demographic features. Overall, amongst the three models, model C returns similar images with the best semantic and stylistic similarity, and it is the model that we're proceeding with. I'll pass it off to Greg to discuss how we bring our selected model to production. Hey, thanks, Wendy. So far, we spoke about our technical approach to build and evaluate our model. But now I'm going to speak about how we brought the similar images model to production and some of the project management approaches that help make this an impactful release. There are three stages of testing, each with their own scale and evaluation metrics and project management milestones. Starting with the raw images and moving all the way to the on-site experiment. We scaled up our testing using different methods and sample sizes and had a milestone at each stage. To evaluate embeddings, we use a quantitative method only and for only 10,000 assets. The milestone was prove the similarity metric of the new model was better than the old one. And it was. At the second stage, we built a face index for 10 million images. We built an app to have a human compare which model was best. The milestone was did the humans think the model was better? And again, they did. Finally, for the site experiment, we scaled up to our entire library of 150 million images, let customers evaluate the model through an A-B test. The milestone, was the test successful? And the answer was yes. Again, it was over 25% improvement over the previous model. To help support the scale and rapid dev time, we have a solid tech stack with modern infrastructure like ECR and ECS running in the cloud. We use advanced open source tools like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Face, as well as enterprise level tools. There are many unexpected challenges that are part of the productionizing process. Resolution considerations are a great example of one of these challenges. Consider this image. It is a happy, smiling black woman with natural hair, patterns in her dress. She's inside holding a cell phone. Looks like she's in a coffee shop or a bar or something like that. If you loaded up your new similar images model and selected this picture to find similar images, you would probably not expect to see results like this. These miss the mark in nearly every aspect of the target image's composition. The rural, outdoors, the rustic, the lighting is different. However, we know from our experience that these errors can occur when resolution isn't tuned well enough. That's why we experiment with several resolution sizes until the results pass our standards for release. Once resolution is correctly chosen, the results are of far higher quality. Notice we match on ethnicity, find pictures of the same woman, patterns in the dress, lighting, color tones, mood, environment, and everything is much better and much more like what you'd expect. And now back to Dan. Thanks, Greg. The systems, processes, and improvements you've seen today have resulted in dramatic improvements to the tools our customers use for visual search on Getty Images and iStock. We hope you've enjoyed seeing the machine learning, data science, and engineering work needed to make this a reality. Our focus on quality, inclusion, and performance steered us in positive directions and created an environment to ask difficult questions about the technology and the product and how it would contribute to Getty's mission of moving the world. There is exciting work still to be done as we continue to innovate in this area of visual search. And we invite you to hang around as we convene for a panel discussion with some Q&A.
And now we'll be back after this. Think about what moves you. A moment, an emotion, a memory, a story, a connection to something real, maybe to something unexpected. We believe in the power of visuals, to ask the questions, to press the issues, to challenge attitudes, to smash through stereotypes. For 25 years, we've collaborated with the world's best photographers, videographers, creative researchers, and the industry's top talent with unmatched access and unique perspectives. We focus our lens on what's right in the world, what demands attention, and what we aspire to. From the commercial to the philanthropic, revenue generating to society changing, market disrupting to headline driving. From the world's biggest stages to the far reaches of the globe, everything we do is to ensure we have the perfect visual that it's easy to find and that it makes a connection. Creative, editorial, archival, custom. Our imagery has the power to move you. And move the world, it does. Welcome back. Once again, we're joined by our team of tech experts here to answer some of the questions that often surface when we talk about visual search. So let's jump right in. Dan, let's go back to why this is important for our customers. They show up on our websites. They've got a picture in their head of what they're looking for. They have to translate that into a bunch of keywords. And then we have to figure out what those keywords mean and show them pictures. We've got millions of photos we could show them. It seems like there's a lot that can go wrong between figuring out what the customer is looking for and returning the right results in our search. How do you see search evolving that, that in a way that makes all this easier? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's a really challenging problem, but it's not just about finding those images that are relevant to what our customers type. Many times our customers struggle to turn that image in their head that you spoke about into words in the first place. And maybe they don't even have an image in their head and they're coming to our sites to be inspired and see new things. Search, uh, it should not be just about presenting a set of results, right? It, it's, and especially just results that are relevant. Our results need to be diverse and appealing in ways that spark our customer's imagination of what's possible while they're trying to tell these stories visually. You saw at the beginning of the presentation Andrea was walking through that common user journey. They start with this idea and they see visuals presented to them. And then their mind begins to latch on to key elements that resonate with them. And they wanna see more options like that. Some of these things maybe are purely visual and difficult to capture in words, like the exact glow they see of an image at sunset or something like that. One thing that I always like to say is that if an image is worth a thousand words to you know, go off the common phrase, wouldn't it be nice if you wouldn't have to type a thousand words to find it? And our visual search team is working on solving that kind of problem for our customers. Yeah, it's really interesting. It reminds me of something I've heard our customers say, which is when we talk to them about, you know, what's the right image? They say the right image is the one I need, which is obvious, but again, there's a lot that can go wrong in terms of trying to figure that out. So Greg, when we think about this, this isn't a traditional e-commerce store, right? We're not selling candles where we've got 40 varieties. We've got hundreds of millions of things that we that we license to our customers in the form of video clips and, and photos and illustrations. So when we think about that, the chances are we've got the right picture for a customer, but does the scale of that inventory, does the scale of that content and the fact that it's always changing, there's millions coming in all the time, does that make these problems more challenging? Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, the scale of the content does make the problem harder, but it also makes it more interesting. And we can use state-of-the-art software 
like Spark or uh, ECS to really um, solve that scale. And we can rapidly switch from, say, a CPU in infrastructure to a GPU infrastructure by using tools like Terraform inside ECS and um, process as many images as, as, uh, as we need to. I, I think at some point we're, we'll be at a billion image company in the next couple of years, and we have to keep being able to scale towards that. So to answer your question, it makes it hard, but it's more interesting and we can use really cool and state-of-the-art tools to solve these challenges. Thanks. Yeah, hard problems are the ones that are fun to solve. So it's uh, it always makes for interesting work. Uh, Dan, when I hear the group talking here today, it's, it's clearly that you're all passionate about this work. Uh, what fires you up when you get up in the morning to, to get down to business? What, what drives that enthusiasm? Yeah, on the technical side, it's, you know, like what Greg said, the sheer scale of our library in size, but also in scope. I'm someone who works in the machine learning space, and that scale of that visual content is usually only found at some of the largest web scale companies. Unlike those libraries, though, our images are comprehensively human labeled with keywords and captions by photographers and creative experts, and that makes them searchable in the first place. And these labels are also incredibly valuable from a machine, you know, machine learning perspective. And that allows us to work on computer vision problems far beyond simple classification. Not only that, but we're surrounded in our work by some top creative minds in the visual industry. You heard a little bit from Wendy about collaborations with our content team. I mean, how many places can you as a data scientist literally walk down the hall and work directly with someone who has reached their, you know, 10,000 hours of mastery curating imagery and can help you build a training set that not only achieves the accuracy goals that you're trying to reach for your model, but is also representative and you know helps you avoid harmful biases in building that training set. That's pretty cool. And I'd also say that our mission at Getty Images is something really special, which uh, is move the world. We aren't in business to generate clicks. You know, oftentimes with search, you're trying to get that engagement, but that's that's not why we're in business. Our visuals reveal not only how the world is today, but what it can be in the future. Our photographers are you know, really inspirational and capture a lot of great moments from around the world. And that's pretty special. And it plays, you know, places a pretty high bar, frankly, on the work that we do in search that drives what visuals our customers see at the end of the day when they're searching. I think we all can you know, we all want to do work that's meaningful and that gets most people excited when they're doing that. And I've seen over and over again in our work, the positive reactions we see from our customers when we roll out these features and how it helps them be better storytellers. And I don't know, that that certainly makes it easy for me to open my laptop every day and go to work. That's awesome. And, and we're touching here, Wendy, on some of the challenges, uh, the fun problems to solve, the vastness of the inventory, the fact that we source a lot of our imagery from, from the crowd and rely on them for things like keywording. What are some of those other challenges that you face in this work and, and how are you confronting those? Yeah, sure. One that comes to mind is knowing what to make out of negative examples. Because we're all familiar with the negativity bias. So even if a model outperforms in 99% of the images, I often find a 1% of not so great examples very sticky. This doesn't only affect myself, but also product managers, engineers. And one way that I found as effective is to quantify these statistics. Um, we can just make sure that we're aware that this is a minority of cases that we are not too happy with and just be courageous at testing whenever we feel ready so the users can speak for themselves for what they prefer through an A-B test. We also try to host discussions early before the test to define what are bad examples or bad cases that would cause us to abandon a model or ditch a project. And overall, it's just good to manage expectations because in the end of the day, um, machine learning is not magic. It will not be a perfect solution, and that is okay, as long as we're aware of its limitations and we're continuously improving. Another challenge is how uh, model evaluation, especially like qualitative model evaluation, can be quite an infinite problem. It's a problem that 
we can probably work on indefinitely because <laughs> the validation set can be bigger, be more comprehensive. And my strategy is to set a timeline and define a framework and key areas that definitely have to be covered and, and stick with that. So an example is that I would set a rule, say we want 10 examples of images that are non-violent, but computer vision models may confuse it with violent images, say like Halloween photos with masks or prop blood that the models may get confused with. Then I go through it and I add 10 different images. And when I reach 10, I make it a hard stop and move on to a different topic. So this allows me to best apply my time and avoid blocking all the subsequent steps and tasks that are just as meaningful and important. That sounds great. And, you know, when you were talking about the, the negative outcomes, I've always thought that when you're doing tests, no matter what, it's there's two good outcomes. There's there's, you know, making an impact and improving things for your customers. That's what we're trying to do. But there's also, did you learn something? If you learn something, it's still a good outcome, even if it didn't work, because now you can figure out what to do next. Um, diversity inclusion is such a, an important part of this. Images are the visual language of our world. It's how we reflect ourselves. It's how we see ourselves. So it's important that we do that in diverse, inclusive, and authentic ways. But when we think about this, Andrea, is it fair to say that some of these models and some of the technology that is being applied could actually reinforce those existing biases? And if that's true, how do we deal with that? Yeah, good question. We we really have to remember that that machine learning and data science at its core is relying on on patterns that are observed in the data. And a lot of the data that that we rely on is is either in our visuals or is is in uh, user generated data. And there's always going to be biases and stereotypes in this data, especially as we look historically. And so any model will inherently have some sort of risk or risk of potentially harmful bias that it can present. And so if we blindly put that model out into production or out into our site, then we run the risk of perpetuating those biases um, and amplifying them out. And so something that we do here is that we take very seriously that, that Wendy was just talking about is we really take the time to make sure we at least understand what those potential biases are and either try to remove them or put safeguards against them or only deploy those models in features or regions where, where those harmful biases could be diminished or um, would be less likely to show up. And so at the end of the day, we're not going to have a perfect model that eliminates all biases, but we can do our best to really understand what those biases are and take action um, to, to make sure they're not showing up in our products. And of course that takes time, but, but that's something that we're really committed to here and that we see as incredibly important before we take any model to production. And we're, we're talking about all this today from a technology point of view, but it seems like to really solve these problems, you need a bunch of other people involved. Can you talk about how you work with other groups or folks within within the broader Getty Images? Yeah, we we work with a, a lot of teams. Um, wh one of the ones that's one of my favorites to work with is our content team. So this is the team that's looking at um, like our creative research and trends. They're looking at what are trends in photography and videography across the world uh, for common topics or 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 popular topics today, whether it be climate change or the pandemic um, or um, uh, diversity and inclusion and representation. And they are just the image experts. They really, really deeply understand the, the imagery and the trends and, and, and how these visuals are evolving. And that's really important to understand because for us, we're responsible for making sure those images that are most current to today are coming up in search. And so how can we use and share data across these teams to really understand um, ultimately the, the, the visuals and imagery that our customers are looking for and want to use and making those, um, not only getting those into our library and making sure our photographers are shooting the, the most relevant content, but then also surfacing that content on our sites and in our search. Well, it's awesome to hear about the work you're doing, the problems you're focused on and how you're cooperating with each other and, and other folks at Getty Image to solve those problems. Uh, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to Andrea, Dan, Greg, and Wendy for sharing their expertise. We'll be back after this.
That's about all the time we have for today. If you have questions about anything you heard today about visual search or any tech related topics, you can email us at techconnect at gettyimages.com. And as mentioned at the top of the show, we are currently recruiting for a number of tech openings. You can see all of those opportunities at careers.gettyimages.com. Thanks again for joining us. I've been your host, Grant Farhall. We'll see you next time on Getty Images Tech Connect. Thank you.